What's going on guys, this is Rob and we are back with Invincible. Yes, we are and we're running a little bit late here, <laughs> but I guess better late than never. It's just been a really, really busy week. I'm buying office space or getting office space. I'm excited about that. So in any event, so what we end up doing is picking up with the, the last video that we did. Well, not really the last one. The last one was like a Spider-Man Invincible crossover, but the one before that. So Omni-Man's basically back here with Debbie and it's kind of crazy because you end up having like Invincible and Adam Eve who show up and they're like, so we kind of have some news and they're like, What's that? And Omni Man's like, so we're gonna go to Telescria and just kind of spend time together. And it's like, well, well, when are you guys going? And it's like, right now. And they like immediately take off, right? So like, they're out of the picture. Now this is cool because from this point going forward, it largely just focuses on Mark, right? Just kind of focuses on his character, his development, that kind of a thing. And he actually ends up coming around to the proper way of thinking. And I'll explain what that means here in a minute. But what we initially do is pick up with this guy who's basically stolen a briefcase of money running around with a gravity gun. And then as soon as Mark catches up to him, he's kind of like, oh, like I didn't not expect Invincible. And then you get like this whole explanation, right? This whole like just hilarious and amazing exchange. So you end up finding out this guy's name is Chris and he actually invented a gravity gun. And the whole reason for this is because he is trying to get enough money to get an engagement ring for his girl. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously this guy has no intention of using, you know, his technology and whatnot to like just rob arbitrarily or something like that. He has the right motivation. He's just doing the wrong thing to achieve his goal. And Mark's kind of like, okay, cool. Look, I get where you're coming from, man. I get that you've, you're kind of in a weird spot. I don't know why you would turn to bank robbery for the purpose of buying an engagement ring, right? Like why would you risk your freedom <laughs> to buy a ring to marry your girl, right? I mean, like you can find other ways. And so Mark ends up taking the money to basically return it to the bank, right? And just kind of, you know, no muss, no fuss, call it a day. And then in turn, he tells them like, just sell your weapons legally, right? Like, like take your stuff and sell it to like scientists or somebody like that. People who will buy it and give you the kind of money you need in order to, you know, be able to, to get this engagement ring, right? So it's kind of a cool little thing. But from that point, you actually switch over to Vegas and Dinosaurus is just tearing everything up right now. Here's a crazy thing about this. Dinosaurus was almost kind of depicted as like a freedom fighter or really more of like a, like a environmentalist, right? Like an extreme environmentalist to a degree, right? In the sense that like his philosophy is, you know, humanity is in a lot of ways kind of a scourge on the planet. But more so than that, his whole stance here, as interesting as it is, he argues that like Las Vegas is a problem, right? That Las Vegas is just this giant, you know, adult playground out in Nevada somewhere. And that the the entire landmass that it takes up, right? All the energy it uses, that if it was all just eliminated, it could be replaced with like solar panels, right? Enough solar panels to actually power the country. And he's like, this place doesn't need to be here. And so he's essentially trying to tear it all down and ruin it all so that he can basically replace it with things that would essentially make the country better, right? I mean, which one makes the country better? Gambling your, your kid's uh, college fund away, hoping that you can make millions of dollars on progressive slots, which you really kind of know you're never going to do, or building solar panels, clean energy. <laughs> <laughs> and so ultimately he ends up revealing that he's got a bomb planted in that location. Uh, Mark ends up getting the bomb, but then that's when Dinosaurus is like, no, 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 no. It would take more than one bomb to blow this place up. It would take 50. And he's like, in reality, you don't have enough to, to stop them all. And then like the entire area explodes. Like literally Las Vegas gets turned to glass, right? Like it's such a massive explosion. It rematerializes the sand in the desert and turns it all to a glass surface. Now, this is kind of viewed to a degree as a catastrophic failure of Mark, both in terms of how he sees himself and to a degree in terms of how the world sees him, right? I mean, they know that Dinosaurus was the one behind this, that this guy was the one that caused this great big huge calamity, that everybody who was in Vegas, for the most part, a lot of people have been evacuated, not everyone, but the entirety of Vegas has been totally destroyed, right? Totally obliterated. And so at that point, you learn a couple different things. One, Cecil's watching all of this unfold, right? So you already kind of know how things are going to go with him. And two, Dinosaurus survived the experience. Now, the funny thing about this is Dinosaurus refers to its human version as like his frail form. So in a lot of ways, Dinosaurus is really kind of a kind of an allegory for the Incredible Hulk, or really just kind of a pastiche of the Incredible Hulk in the Invincible series. Albeit, take away the idea of the Incredible Hulk just being like a mindless brute that wants to be left alone and just smash his stuff and just kind of switch him over to being this kind of, you know, uh, environmentalist guy who believes that like a lot of the stuff that humanity does is really just making things worse as opposed to making things better, right? That's what a lot of that turns into. And so you do have a few things 
things that take place here most notably one of the big issues mark is contending with is the idea that while he and adam eve have like invincible ink and they're kind of like a small little superhero team or superhero organization that they have the power to make the world better the reality is that things just keep getting worse but the biggest problem with this is that mark is looking at everything from a short-term perspective right like the destruction of las vegas i mean sure it sucks that vegas got blown up the reality is some good could actually come out of that and we'll see how that takes place but that's one of the biggest issues that mark has like so many of us he's looking at the short term in the moment this is bad therefore it will always be bad which is not true right like things may suck in the moment but they can get better later on down the line at the end of the day it really all comes down to how much of a sacrifice you're willing to make and that's one of the things that we'll talk about you know as we kind of get further through this but what you actually end up doing is switching over to the return of robot and monster girl right now these characters had at one point in time been basically sucked into the portal to the thraxon realm and just kind of been ruling it for about 12 years and so robot showing back up here while it was 12 years there it was nowhere near as long here it was like eight months right it was basically the time that invincible was gone when he was out in space during the Viltrumite War. And so one of the things that happens is one, Robot wants to be referred to as Rex. That's the name he wants to be called. Seemingly as kind of a, a bit of a way to honor uh, Rex Splode. The other part of this is that because he was the leader of the Guardians of the Globe for a time, that in turn, because Cecil has what is basically an expanded superhero roster. So you've got Capes Incorporated, you got the Actioneers, you have Wolfman and the Wolf Corps, you got Tech Jacket, of course, we're already familiar with him from the Viltrumite War. Uh, you have basically these big superheroes of teams, especially when it comes to the expanded roster of the Guardians of the Globe. Something that I also want to point out here, I believe these all have individual comics, so if you're interested, we can cover some of them. I can't promise that all of them are interesting, but we can cover some of them. But he basically says, like, because you have and historically have been the best person suited to basically run a superhero team, specifically the reformed Guardians of the Globe, I want you to run all these teams, right? I want you to basically be the leader of all this stuff. And ultimately, Robot is not how he used to be. If you guys recall, when he was in his younger human form and even before that when he was really just a robot while he was you know a machine there was a little pep in him right a little kind of like yeah you know things are kind of cool he doesn't really have that anymore right like that's basically gone for the most part he's just really struggling with depression is what it looks like and maybe even a little ptsd thrown in there but he's really just kind of a shade of his former self in a lot of different ways but ultimately he ends up taking it under the idea that it's a welcome distraction from whatever it is that he's dealing with at the moment and so what you end up doing is switching over to monster girl who in the 12 years that she's been out there, she's kind of grown up to a degree and things are a bit on the rocks, right? I mean, something seems to have happened during their time when they were basically ruling the Flaxen Empire that things have just kind of been irrevocable in some form or fashion. We don't really know how, we don't really know what it is that took place. We simply just know there's a rift between them now that simply wasn't there before. Now, as far as Mark goes, this is one of the ways in which Mark's thinking is basically beginning to turn around. That he has this conversation with Cecil where he says like he imagines a time where he doesn't really have to wear a costume anymore right when he can just kind of do his thing just sort of live his life and the world can basically take care of itself it is a lot of pressure on mark with regards to the fact that he is the strongest superhero on earth a lot of the other heroes don't really seem to measure up to the various challenges that are out there so whether cecil would admit it or not it usually ends up coming down to mark but one of the things that he starts to realize is that a lot of what cecil has done insofar as locking up different heroes keeping them contained confined that it really was the right thing to do given the circumstance he's coming more around to the thought process of Cecil that he's not really a, a straight villainous guy. And even this kind of ties into the idea that Mark's history of just like punching the bad guys, right? And like saving a bridge or something like that, that it doesn't actually fix anything, right? Like Mark's actions up to this point have basically been tantamount to like protesting, right? Like a person has done something that I don't like, so I'm going to stand over there with a sign for a day and a half and then go home, right? Like what, like that's not gonna do anything, right? Like you're easily ignored and you usually will be <laughs> you know protesting very rarely ever solves anything so because of that it's kind of mark's equivalent of that right like i saved a bridge or a woman was falling and i rescued her right like this is cool in the moment but it has no real lasting impact on anything and doesn't really make the world better in any real measurable way and so coming around to to cecil's thought process and basically realizing that in order to do some good sometimes you got to do some bad right like you got to be machiavellian right you got to be willing to be a terrible person if it means the end result is a net positive you have to lose yourself essentially that sometimes that's just the way it goes and so ultimately Cecil reveals like hey okay look I'm glad you're thinking this way there's some things that I've been keeping from you and he basically reveals to Mark the fact that all those different versions of Invincible from across the multiverse if you guys remember that story with Angstrom Levy where he had summoned those different versions of Invincible 
who were like criminals and they were evil, stuff like that, that a lot of those versions of Mark that were killed had been turned into reanimate, right? Those uh, those kind of robotic, zombified individuals who basically just follow orders. And Mark kind of looks around and where, where Cecil's expecting him to just freak and lose his mind, Mark's like, I mean, it makes me kind of uncomfortable, but at the same time, it kind of makes sense. I could definitely see why you're doing this, right? I mean, the various forces that you had before couldn't even stand against me. What hope would they have against somebody who's slightly weaker than me, right? Like, in order to do your job effectively, you're gonna have to have forces at your disposal that can basically go toe to toe against some pretty heavy hitters. And so Mark's like, it doesn't change anything, right? If you need me, call me. If there's nothing else you need, then I gotta bounce. And he basically leaves, right? He's perfectly content with what it was that Cecil was doing, whereas Cecil was expecting this just like huge, just kind of popping off, right? This sort of just explosion of him basically losing his mind. And so at this point, you switch back over to Monster Girl. And it's kind of funny because you end up having this, this scenario <laughs> where everybody is essentially macking on Monster Girl. And so while all this is going on, <laughs> <laughs> All these guys are giving her this attention that Robot is just kind of watching it go down, right? What Robot's just kind of watching it happen. And it makes him a little uncomfortable to a degree and even kind of says that. And in fact, there's one point during this party where basically Bulletproof is like, hey, what's going on, Monster Girl? Like, I am the king of getting people reacquainted. Let's, just, let's, let's come hang out, right? We'll get you reacquainted. Right? You know, it's turning into the opening scene of a black episode, right? Like, that's literally what it's turning into. Uh, don't ask me how I know that. Don't judge me. So nonetheless, right? It's, like ultimately she kind of nips that in the bud right off the bat and it's like oh no 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 first of all nothing's gonna happen right like we're not gonna be knocking boots right that ain't happened in bulletproof she's like it's just too soon right so seemingly the the kind of blossoming romance right that almost puppy love that existed between monster girl and robot or i guess rex we can call him now seemed to kind of come to fruition when they were in the when they were ruling the flax and empire and then fell apart but you get this kind of crazy revelation here right where they're basically in the kind of like their their base of operations that uh that robot getting ready to leave when Monster Girl walks in, you know, and, and she's like, well, I didn't know you were here. He's like, no, it's fine. I'm getting ready to go. And when he kind of asks, you know, like, it's weird being back after all this time, she wants to kind of talk, right? You know, she asks him, like, can we talk? And he's like, no. And she's like, can we please talk about it? And he says, I came back here to leave behind everything we built and forget what you did. Please, Amanda, why won't you let me forget? So seemingly whatever happened here was at least it seemed to be a betrayal on behalf of Monster Girl, right? That Monster Girl seemed to have done something. It's kind of wild. But from there, you actually switch over to Las Vegas. Now, this is one of those instances where I basically, you know, I, I presented to you guys this argument in order to make an omelet, you got to break a few eggs. Does it suck that Las Vegas got destroyed? Sure. Does it suck that a few people died? Yeah. But the end result is a net gain. And that's one of the big issues, one of the big things that we've talked about from a philosophical level here on this YouTube channel, that there are, there's a lot of progress that humanity can make, but people allow the just inherent value of a human life as if there is such a thing to get in the way of that, right? Like everyone's life is valuable. Every, you know, that should never be sacrificed or compromised in any way. And in believing that humanity actually ends up holding itself back, right? Preventing itself from becoming something better. And so because of this, this presents a scenario where in, in the place of, of Las Vegas being totally obliterated just by its sheer location, the entire area being turned to glass that Chris had actually been brought in to work for Cecil Stedman. And because Chris was basically a genius after inventing that gravity gun, that with his intelligence and capabilities, he developed double-sided solar panels. So the solar panels can absorb energy from the sun, but because the sun, of course, doesn't shine directly on the panels, it shines on the ground, it hits the glass and bounces back up to the other side of the solar panel. So basically they're producing twice the amount of solar energy that a normal solar panel would be able to produce. That this is a net gain for humanity and all it required was the sacrifice of some human lives. And at the end of the day, if that really is what happens, then it is a better thing, right? I mean, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. I, I I understand that people cherish the value of human life. I don't know why people argue that human lives are just inherently valuable, right? You are valuable because you just exist and that's enough, right? I mean, if that's the argument, every fascist dictator in the history of the world matters simply because they exist, right? Like we as society create standards, I would argue arbitrary standards based on what defines the value of a human life. This is a positive game. And it's one of the things that said, like this was phenomenal and even Mark is just like, damn man, Dinosaurus was right. Like Las Vegas gets totally obliterated. The place gets turned to glass, but the benefit, the net gain for society is inherently better, right? A better thing came out of the destruction of Las Vegas. It just took the destruction of Las Vegas and the loss of a few human lives. And that was basically it. And so 
so again, it's kind of an interesting thing. A lot of people would stand against that and say, no, that's never okay. And to those people, I would say, then you're the reason why society doesn't progress. But nonetheless, one of the things that actually goes on here is Mark sits down with, uh, with Adam Eve, right? After having this revelation about dinosaurs, he sits down with Adam Eve and he's like, okay, so... I need to ask you something. And she's like, what? He's like, you love me, right? You would always love me. Like you would love me no matter what. And she says, yes. And he's like, even if I told you that what I'm about to do or something that I am going to do flies in the face of everything that we believe, flies in the face of everything that we stand for. And she's like, okay, I mean, the short answer is sure. I mean, you know, as long as it's not like some kind of a heinous thing, you're not gonna like go the route of your dad and like just, you know, try to conquer the world, then sure. And he's very, very cloak and dagger about it. Doesn't really give her any definitive answers, but instead what we end up finding out is that he agrees with dinosaurs, right? That in order to make the world a better place, that sometimes you got to sacrifice a few things. Now, the lengths at which dinosaurs went to achieve his goal is still a little extreme for Mark. And I think for most people, it would still be a little extreme. We'll eventually get to that point when it's considered to be acceptable, but at the moment, it's a little extreme. And so that's when Mark goes to visit dinosaurs with the intention of breaking him out. Now, this is a big no-no, man. Like dinosaurs literally destroyed Vegas. So at this point, Cecil's like, no, right? We can't abide this like this cannot be tolerated but the funny thing about it is that unlike the incredible hulk who transforms through rage this guy only turns into dinosaurs when he feels indifferent right when he doesn't care about what's going on at the time and that's why he's surrounded by stuff right he's in like a super comfy chair he's watching like tv shows looks like he's eating ramen right it's all based on him just like caring about stuff right being unable to be indifferent to his situation and so he's like if you want me to transform and for me to turn into di uh, dinosaurs you got to make me feel indifferent and so mark starts telling his life story. <laughs> <laughs> the most boring thing there ever was. Mark starts telling this story and then like dinosaurs is just like, oh my God, he's like, I don't care. Boom, he transforms, right? Turns into dinosaurs. <laughs> and he's like, okay, so dinosaurs obviously being the brains of the operation, it's, it's almost like the Incredible Hulk having the intelligence of Banner. So like Professor Hulk, basically, he's just kind of like, okay, so if I deduce this correctly, then you're only here for a couple reasons. You would not break me out and you certainly wouldn't have my other half transform into me unless you absolutely have have to. He's like, so as unbelievable as it might sound, you seem to have come around to my way of thinking that if you are really wanting to help the world improve and become a better place, then you recognize some folks are just going to have to die. But that's crazy, right? And Mark's kind of like, okay, look, like I get what you're saying, right? Like he says, I have to admit your methods are inexcusable to the point that it's hard to just stand here and talk to you. You've killed so many people, destroyed homes and entire city. And he says, all worthy sacrifices for the greater good. As as I recall, when your father attempted to take over this planet, you fought him, and in the process, some lives were lost. What I did was no different. And ultimately, Mark says, it wasn't remotely. No, this isn't the time for this. He says, what I'm getting at is, I've been dealing with this, right? Being invincible for a while now, and I have all these powers, and I do what I do to use them to help people. I look back after all this time, and I think, I don't know that I'm actually helping anybody, right? Making the world better. And I feel like that's what I should be doing. I'm maintaining the status quo at best, simply just putting out fires. And that's one of the things that we've kind of argued when it comes to superheroes, that's largely what they do, right? Superheroes are like the government, right? Like, you know, violence by a different means, right? Suppressing a protest or a violent protest, violence by a different means, right? And so ultimately superheroes exist to maintain the status quo. Superheroes exist to ensure that things stay the way they're supposed to be. If you look at superheroes across the board, that's the case. When has Superman created a circumstance whereby some pauper down on his luck has somehow managed to become a billionaire, right? I mean, I guess maybe sending him to some shelter somewhere, but the help they get is designed to help them stay where they are, not become better than what they are. I guess maybe on some kind of a moral and philosophical level, but not by tangibly improving their lives. That's the role that superheroes play. And that's the role that Mark plays, right? Mark is kind of like, I'm looking around and I'm maintaining the status quo. More so than that, Dinosaurs is 100% right. When a fight broke out between Mark and his father, Mark's biggest concern was, my dad has to be stopped. Otherwise, he's going to conquer the world. If he conquers the world, then who knows how many more other people will die. Therefore, anybody who does die and any stuff that is destroyed in my fight with my father, well, that's just an acceptable instance of collateral damage. He didn't vocally say that, but his actions reflected that. But one of the funny things about this is that us as like comic book readers or as human beings, we would 
could arbitrarily create a difference there using whatever desire we choose to create that difference. You know, we would just arbitrarily create differences when in reality, there isn't one, right? It's just the difference we create to maintain our own moral compass and to basically prevent ourselves from moving into the realm of accepting the fact that in order for things to improve, usually some folks have to die. And so it gets kind of crazy because in the middle of all this, Cecil just starts sending in the reanimin, right? These invincible reanimin. <laughs> sends these guys flying in there. And in turn, like while, while they're literally fighting him and trying to survive against these just armies of armies of marks, that ultimately he's like, okay, look, you know, I'm totally down with your philosophy. I like your idea. You have the ability to tangibly help the world. What I cannot do is stand by and watch as innocent people die. There has to be a better way to do this. The reality is there are some, but sacrifices are going to have to be made, right? People are going to have to be sacrificed for the benefit of the greater good, right? The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And so ultimately they kind of agree. And then dinosaurs is like, okay, cool. I'm down with that. Get us out of here. And Mark basically just, just breaks them out. Right. At that point, Cecil goes to, to Adam Eve and he's like, yeah. So like basically Mark broke dinosaurs out of prison. She's like, what? <laughs> No way, right? That's ridiculous. But ultimately you pick back up in the secret base of dinosaurs and Mark's like, let's save the world, right? Like when dinosaurs ask him, are you ready to get started? Mark's like, yeah, let's save the world. Let's make the world a better place. With that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this to an end. Thank you guys for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.